Give you a minute to turn to that. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Reading from New American Standard Version. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word and to our study. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. I will, I will tell you, I, um, <laughs> I really don't need much uh, encouragement because I got very excited when I was doing my um, study of this. Um, it's so interesting. The Lord just gives you things. He just hands them to you on a silver platter, and that's what he did for me because, trust me, I'm not smart enough to figure this stuff out. I'm not, okay? The Lord is like, okay, here, here, Harold, let me give you this. <laughs> Basically spoon-fed it to me, which I am so grateful for. So I'm kind of excited um, to kind of talk about what I, I was given, okay? Um, so like Mike read is in, in verse 12, this fear and trembling, I was like, okay, and, and honestly, I was, I was praying on the way to work, and this verse just came into my head. Um, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And my first reaction was that we were supposed to be afraid, right? Fear and trembling. Every time you hear that verse, you just think, oh, I'm supposed to be afraid of God. I'm, you know, ooh, fear and trembling. I'm going to be killed or I'm going to be struck down if I don't do something right, right? Um, that is not the case. We talked about this in Sabbath school where, we're, where I looked up the Greek word of what things are supposed to mean. Changes everything. Changes everything. Um, the phrase fear and trembling is also used in two other verses, and we're going to look those up. So the first verse is in 2 Corinthians um, 713. Well, that's first Corinthians. <laughs> oh, I marked it with my little thing. See, I, I was kind of prepared. I actually marked it with my little thingies here this time. What are th does anybody know what these are called? Just markers? Okay. <laughs> I thought, thought there was a fancy word or something for them. Anyway. All right. Uh, second Corinthians 715 reads 15. And this is talking about Titus, right? And his affections are greater for you. Well, no, let me, let's back up. Let me read. Yeah, no, 713. Uh, let's go to 13 and, and kind of back up. It says, therefore, we have been comforted in your comfort, and we rejoice exceedingly more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I have boasted to him about you, I am not ashamed, but as we spoke to all things to you in truth, even so our boasting to Titus was found true. So Paul's bragging on these people, right? He's telling Titus, these people are amazing. They love the Lord. They're awesome. And his affections are greater for you as he remembers the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. Therefore, I rejoice that I have confidence in you in everything. What? <laughs> so they're afraid of him? No, no. Context. Look at the scripture in context. No, they're not afraid of him. They were happy. They were rejoicing. Does rejoicing go with fear and trembling? Not in the context we think of it, right? So the other verse is in 1 Corinthians um, 2, verse 3. So let's start at verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him, and him crucified. 
I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstrations of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen is right. Was, was Paul afraid when he was preaching to these people? No. <laughs> Spirit of power. He was, he was preaching his heart out. He was preaching his heart out. So let's, let's go back and look at that then. Um, the Greek word for fear is translated in these contexts is respect or reverence. So BibleHub.com, if you go to BibleHub.com and you type in whatever verse you want to look, it will, if you click on the GRE or whatever, it will take you to the Greek, and it will tell you word by word the Greek words for every part of that phrase. And then if you hover over it, it would tell you the meaning of that Greek word. I know, it's amazing. So when you do that, when you're looking at these scriptures, just and they're like, man, I'm just, I'm not getting it. Um, try that, try that. Um, the, 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 the Greek word for fear is also, fear is one thing, but also can mean respect or reverence. Uh, trembling, um, the Greek word for that is shaken or quaking. So that's a little different. So when something, what happens when the earth shakes? Right? Everybody gets scared. But what happens to everything on the ground? It comes tumbling down, right? Everything gets shaken to your core. You are reduced to ground zero. You have humility, right? You don't, you're not up here. You are brought down, right? We all have to have humility. So in these two verses, fear and trembling convert to respect and humility. That's what he was trying to say in all these verses, every one of them. So work out your own salvation with respect and humility to each other. Um, 1 Corinthians um, 2, 3, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and himself crucified. I was with you in weakness, in respect and humility, in fear and trembling, respect and humility. Titus was brought in with, and they received him with, respect and humility. They weren't, there's no, there's no fear in these three verses. It's respect and humility, okay? So, again, if you don't, if you're ever reading um, scripture and you're having a hard time seeing the love of God in these scriptures, the scripture isn't the problem. The problem is you. <laughs> I hate to say that so harshly, but the problem is your understanding of scripture. Go back, look at the Greek, and try to work on seeing the love of God when you read scripture, because I've done that before. I've come to class. I'm like, I'm just not, I'm not getting it. I'm not getting it. I need somebody's help. And then when they tell me and show me that what they think the scripture means, then I'm able to see the love of God in scripture. Every time you read scripture, you need to see the love of God in scripture. Okay. So don't think, oh, I'm the smartest person in the, the world and I know how to interpret scripture. Don't. Most people that interpret scripture are, are illiterate at best in Bible, in, in the Bible, in the way it is, okay? I'm still learning. We are all still learning. And we've been reading this thing for how many years now? Exactly. It's, it is probably, I think, the Bible is one of the most complex and intricate books um, of, of any kind of book ever written because of the complexity of it and what it means and how many layers there is. I know it's kind of funny, Abby and, and Brandon and Derek, they all like the Star Wars trilogy and stuff. And they can talk about in detail 
Well, in episode one, when Padme says this, she was actually referring back to episode seven, and no, 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 and they go back and forth all the time about these little, what they call Easter eggs, right? So how things connect. This Bible connects in so many ways, it's not funny. And people that think they understand it, well, I read it, why shouldn't I understand it? Mm, there's so many, so many layers, you know, kind of like Shrek with his onions. There's layers, there's layers of this Bible that we will never understand until we get to heaven. So please, if you're reading your Bible and you don't see the love of God, check yourself, give yourself some humility and ask for help, right? Um, I don't care what generation you're from. Um, every generation has their way of speaking, right? They have certain words that mean different things. Um, most of you uh, from the 70s, right? Groovy. Groovy, baby. Groovy. All <laughs> right? That was a word. A groove is a groove. But there's a different meaning to it, right? Um, one of the words in, I think it was like the 90s, was sick. Oh, that is so sick, right? That means it's cool. But if I said that to Portia, I was like, oh, you look so sick. She's like, well, what's wrong with me? Oh, I don't, I don't feel bad, right? Read the root words of these scriptures, okay? Different meanings happen at different times, right? Different generations make words mean things. Mike had told me once, he has a, a dictionary from the, what, 1800s or something? Yeah. Whoa, totally different what words mean back in the 1800s to what they mean now, right? Words take on different meanings. So don't, don't get frustrated. Don't put up your hand. We'll see. God doesn't love me. <laughs> no, he does. They're just using different words to try to portray that. Um, so one of my favorite sayings, and some of you might know this if you've had kids, is Brandon used to watch Thomas the Tank Engine, right? And one of the things Mr. The, the conductor would say to Thomas when he wasn't being good was, you're causing confusion and delay. So when Brandon... <laughs> We get in the car, he would inevitably always take his shoes off. We would tell him 50 times, Brandon, when you get in the car, don't take your shoes off. Every time, kicks his shoes off. Brandon, why'd you take your shoes off? We went from our house to grandma's. Two minutes, he would, and we had to put his shoes back on him. And we, we were like, Brandon, you're causing confusion and delay. So we weren't telling him he was being bad, but he knew what confusion and delay meant because that means Thomas was being bad and he was being bad. So that was, our, that was one of our favorite things. And I actually said that at work the other day to, <laughs> to one of the kids that work for me now um, because they're a Brandon's age. A lot of them are Brandon's age now. And I'm like, oh, said you are causing confusion and delay. And they looked at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so a couple of them that had watched Thomas or had kids that watched Thomas knew what I was talking about, but they were like, what? Yeah, no understanding. No understanding of what I was saying. Um, so let's go back to verse 12 and look at what precedes fear and trembling. Uh, verse 12, therefore, my beloved, let me make sure I'm, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, obeyed who? Paul, right? Paul was there teaching them. They obeyed his teachings of Christ while he was there, right? So we need to remember, and this is one of the big things is, at the very beginning of your chapters, each one of your chapters, and I encourage you to do this, it talks about the Philippians, okay? It gives you a history. It gives you a rundown who they were, what they were, where they were, what environment was going on around them, and it kind of gives you the setting, right? So just like I said, Abby knows when I say her outfit looks sick, Portia doesn't understand that, right? Look at the time they were in, right? So it's interesting, uh, it had been taken over 
by the Romans and was used as a military outpost. Right? Did you know that? I didn't know that. So it's interesting. So this, this military outpost that Paul is trying to convert to Christianity, Mike can tell you, if you've been around a lot of military guys, their whole idea of anything is might makes right. Right? If I'm the strongest, what I say goes. Is that not the opposite of what Jesus teaches in weakness, right? In, in, in your weakness, I'm strong. Um, so also, um, let me go back. Paul also struggled with within the church that he set up to prevent what's called there were, there were two parts of the church that he was dealing with. One was legalism, and one was, and I didn't know this, it's called nominism. Anti-nominism. Uh, A-N-T-I-N-O-M-I-A-N-I-S-M. Anti-nominism. Who knows what that means? Right? I was like, what does that mean? So I had to look it up. See, it's amazing. I... I was spoon-fed this. I'm just telling you, I was spoon-fed this by the Lord. Okay, anti-nominism is the opposite of legalism. So Paul, in his church, had two sides that were going on at the same time. He had the legalists that were still very much the Jewish tradition. You can't walk too many steps on the Sabbath. You can't take care of anybody on the Sabbath. Um, you can't mix milk and something. I don't know. <laughs> All those rules, okay? You had the legalists. Then you had the anti-nominism. I hope I'm saying that right. I really do. Um, who were the opposite. They were like, I'm justified by faith. None of your stuff applies to me. Your Ten Commandments, none of your rules apply to me. I can do what I want. I am saved by faith. He had two ends of the spectrum that he was trying to get to come together. So when you read, when you read this scripture, this, this letter that he's written to them, and you are looking at, he's got basically two kids that are on the opposite end of the spectrum, and he's trying to get them to come together to, to, for as one, right? And he keeps saying that, trying to come together as one in Christ. Um, so let's see. Um, do, do, do. Now I'm getting ahead of myself because I get excited and I, I start talking really fast. Um, so when he tells the people of Philippi, verse 12, um, so have you have, have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. So you were minding when I was there. Now when I'm gone, I also need you to mind. Okay. So it's kind of like your parents. <laughs> when my mom and dad would go to the store and leave my brother and I alone, when they were there, we weren't fighting. But as soon as they went out the door, we started in on each other. And we didn't stop until they got back, right? Same thing, same thing. You behaved while I was there. Now I need you to behave while I'm not there, okay? Be good little boys and girls. Um, work out your own salvation. And what does that mean, work out? Well, we're going to get to that. Um, see, I went ahead of myself. So let's go back. I'm sorry. Let's go back to um, on the legalism side. So let's go back to the legalism side. So first of all, one of the things, um, let's see. On one side, he has legalism who feel that you can't walk too many steps on the Sabbath. Uh, Jesus gave to us uh so basically what they're doing is forgetting the sacrifice Jesus made by keeping the law, right? Um, Jesus said in Matthew 5.17, let's go to Matthew 5.17. See, I get ahead of myself when I start getting excited. I need to just follow, slow down, follow the thing. 5.17.
Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but fulfill, right? Jesus fulfilled that law for us. Um, by keeping the laws, they are denying Jesus, right? The legalists are denying Jesus and relying on themselves for their own salvation, right? That's, that's, not, that's not the side we want to be on. Uh, on the other side, with the anti nominalists who believe in justifi justification through faith alone, and that none of the commandments, even the Ten Commandments, apply to them, let's go to James 2. Oop, just missed it. James 2, verses, let's just go through 14 through 20. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith, but by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? As a teacher of the gospel, Paul was worried that the church he started... Um, was failing, right? So the next verse says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So basically Paul is telling both sides, <laughs> you're causing confusion and delay, right? He's telling them both. You're, you're not. You're causing confusion and delay. Um, work it out for yourself. Stop fighting against each other. Because that's what his church was doing. They were fighting against each other. So now... Work out, right? The word work out. Work out, put some effort. Put some effort into reading, studying, learning what the Bible says. Because at the time, he was there with them. Yeah, Paul, we'll do what you say. We'll follow in your footsteps. You just tell us what to do and we'll do it, right? How many of us have ever been on a diet and saw somebody who had lost a lot of weight, just tell me what you did. Just tell me what you did, and I'll do that, and then I'll lose weight. Did you put in any of the work? No. You got to put the work in. The work is what causes the reward, right? Just because I was told something doesn't mean I know it, right? Um... Abby will back me up. Anybody in healthcare will back me up. When you are in class, in nursing school, or in even tech school, they'll tell you, oh, this is what you do when this happens. And then when this happens, you're like, oh, hair's on fire. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> right? Even though you know what to do, you have to experience it. You have to put the work in. So now, when a code happens, you see these nurses that are just machines that go in there, all right, let's get this line started. Let's get, a, let's get this patient intubated. Let's get this. Let's get that. Boom, boom, boom. Where's the doctor? I don't know. <laughs> Hurry up, somebody go get the doctor. We got to get this stuff started. They know what to do in a crisis because they have worked in that crisis before, and they know what to do, right? Um, experience and personal experience changes you. We kind of talked about this in Sabbath school with the crucible, right? You have to go through things to become changed. Same thing. You have to work this out yourself. You have to put the work in, reading the Bible, studying the Bible, digging deep, going to the internet, look at what other people say, looking up the Greek root words of stuff, okay? You have to put the work in. Um, don't just wait till somebody spoon feeds it to you. It is your responsibility. 
your responsibility. That's what he's telling them. It's your responsibility to work this out. Um, it's not the pastor's. It's not the elders. It's not the Sabbath school teacher's responsibility. Are we there for you as a resource? Yes, we are. We are there for a resource. When you have questions and are struggling, we are there to help you. Yes, we are. But I can't make you, right? Like a school teacher, you know you can't make kids do anything, right? You can tell them these are the consequences. If you don't do the homework, you're not going to be ready for the test. Right? If you don't study for the test, you're not going to do good on the test. If they don't care, they don't care. You can't make them care. You have to put the work in. Um, you have to want to come and listen. Again, fear and trembling, respect and humility. Be respectful of those who teach God's love. Get that? Be respectful of those who teach God's love. Everyone sees God's love through a different set of eyes. Um, don't blind yourself just because you can't see it. Um, you might not be ready. You, you might not be ready to see that level of love yet. Um, my view of love at 52 is different than my view of love at 25, right? Some of us that have been married a long time know that first couple years of love is different than this 25, 26 years of love is different, right? There is a difference. Just because I come up here as a 52-year-old and talk about God's love to me, you sitting out there at 25 are like, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. I don't see that. Our, uh, respect, respect and humility to those that are teaching you. I am teaching you from my perspective, right? So my perspective of God's love is different than your perspective of God's love. Um, oh, the, the, one, the one thing I always remember we used to tell the kids uh, from Shrek was when he would tell Donkey, you're on your way to a smack bottom, right? <laughs> right? That's a, that's that was a different view of love than my kids had, right? I was doing it out of love because I the correction needed to be there. And I warned them, you're on your way to a smack bottom. I can guarantee you right now, Abby never got to there. Brandon, yeah, all the time. <laughs> oh, that boy was so stubborn. So stubborn. <laughs> anyway, my view of love in correction is different then than it is now. To give correction to Brandon now, I can't tell him he's on his way to a smack bottom because he's six foot two and 175 pounds. He doesn't care. <laughs> that's not going to. That's not going to get his attention. I have to show my love differently. I have to lead him gently through the way because now he should have some understanding at his age. Whereas at that age, he had no understanding. I just needed his attention to do what I told him to do, right? Um, so don't, don't interpret someone's preaching of God's love. Don't just see it through your eyes. Try to see it through their eyes, but be respectful, right? And humble yourself. You might not understand it yet. You might not be there. They just might have a higher understanding. I can tell you, I just went through school a few years ago. There were a few chapters in my molecular book. Did I read it? Yeah. Did I understand it? No, not at all. <laughs> but when I started working in it, when I went and did it, when I actually went and worked in that environment, I'm like, oh, that's what that means. I understand now. Exactly. Exactly. Be respectful. Um, was I respectful then? No. I'm like, this is stupid. Why do I need to know this? I'm never going to use this. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm like, oh, man. Dang it. I'm using it. <laughs> One of the ladies at my work, she just finished the program like a couple weeks ago that I did three years ago. And every day she would come to me. This is stupid. Why do I need to learn this? 
<laughs> you will. You will. You will learn it. Trust me. It will come up fairly soon. You're, you're like, man, I didn't think I needed to know this, but I guess I did. I'm like, you're going you're gonna to see. I'm like, She's like, whatever. <laughs> um, humility. This virtue seems to be getting lost, right? In this day and age of Google, right? I, I have every bit of information at my fingertips, right? This humility is like, you can't tell me anything. I can't look up and figure out myself. Want to bet? <laughs> Want to bet? That's where experience comes in. Yeah, I can look at a video on YouTube on how to hang a door frame. Is it going to be level or square? No. <laughs> That's why we had somebody come in and redo our kitchen. <laughs> it wasn't square. Um, experience accounts for something. Have humility. Humble yourself when someone's trying to teach you something, right? Humble yourself. Maybe I can learn something from them. Try to learn something from them. Don't act like a know-it-all, okay? Um, and, <laughs> and no one cares what you had for dinner last night. Stop posting that stuff on social media, okay? You think you're so important. Everybody needs to know what I'm doing. No, we don't. No, no, we don't. We don't care what you had for dinner, and if there's a picture of it. That's nice. <laughs> I had stripples. Woo! Yeah, <laughs> love stripples, but I didn't tell everybody about it. Um, hum humble yourselves, okay? You're not as important as you think you are. We have so many people. I'm a social media influencer. Whoop de doo. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I'm glad you're having your best life. You know what? So am I. That's why I don't care about yours. <laughs> right? Um, my view of myself compared to God, the creator of the universe, I am nothing compared to him. I have enough humility to know that he knows what's best for my life, right? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, right? There's a song we sing about that. He knows what's best for you. You need to, what's the phrase? Check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? <laughs> right? Humble yourself. Follow and learn what God wants for you because he knows what's best. Even though you don't think he does, he knows what's best for you. Um, One of the things I want people to stop doing is listening to the lies of the world. I cannot tell you how on social media, oh, the Bible is just a bunch of stories. They're not for real. They're just made up. Um, God's not real. He's just a fictional character, right? He's just... It's just something the church made up to control you. I've heard that. Have, how many of you have heard that? I've heard that on social media. Um, what was it? Um, the people that are denying God and denying the, the validity of the Bible are so illiterate, it's not funny. You and I have been studying this thing for years and years and years, and we find something new all the time. Don't listen to those people who say, oh, well, the verse says this, so God obviously means to kill me. Stop. Okay, you read the verse five minutes ago, and you think you're a Bible scholar. Stop listening to those people, okay? They don't know what they're talking about. They don't. Are they looking for God's love in this word? No, they're not. They're listening to Satan whisper in their ear, God hates you. Hey, they're not listening to the God loves you. Now read this and find God's love in it. They're not. So stop listening to those people. They are illiterate in what the Bible tells us and what it means. Okay? We're still learning. So don't, don't pull somebody up on the internet that read a verse five minutes ago. Okay? Stop doing that. Stop listening to the people that don't come to church every Sabbath. 
Stop listening to those people that will pick one verse out of the Bible and take it out of context, like they even know the context, to try to tell you you are wrong for following Jesus. Stop. Oh, witty. I'm like, I'm going to get on my soapbox. This really. Mm. <laughs> those people just oh, get to me. But humility, respect and humility is what you have to have when you start reading the Bible and following Jesus, right? So just like at the Church of Philippi, <clears throat> on one side or the other, any extreme, both sides are lost. Um, C.S. Lewis wrote uh, the screw tape letters. And basically in one part of, of the screw tape letter, because he talks about the war, because it was all during World War II, and the lesser demon was confronting with the higher demon. Well, how do I get my guy off the path? Um, should I make him ultra patriotic or do I make him a pacifist? And the senior demon goes, it doesn't matter. Any extreme will do. Right? Any extreme will do where you see the other side and you hate them for what they stand for. Any extreme will do. Okay? So his church was on two extremes. Both sides were being lost. He was trying to bring them together. Um, so 13, verse 13, for it is God who works in you both. Get it? Works in you both. That, that whole sentence took on a whole new meaning when I learned there were two sides of the church trying to be reconciled, right? So for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So you both have a common goal to do God's pleasure, to let him work in you to do his good pleasure. You can't do your good pleasure. You can't do your good pleasure. You're doing your will is to do God's good pleasure, right? So I want to end, and this is from uh, Prophets and Kings. I have the, the uh, Remnant Study Bible with Ellen White comments. So this is one of the comments on this verse. So I want to end, pardon me, I want to end with that. And it says, so verse 213, it says, a divine principle. Herein is revealed the outworking of the divine principle of cooperation. Get that? cooperation without which no true success can be attained human effort avails nothing without divine power and without human endeavor divine effort is with many to no avail to make God's grace our own we must act our part his grace is given to work in us to will and to do but never as a substitute for our effort. God is here to partner with you to get the work done, right? Without him, your work is nothing, right? Without your work, God can't work through you. He's got to have people to work through. He can't do it alone. He needs us and we need him. Cooperation, okay? God loves you, he wants to work with you, and he wants to be with you because he wants to see as many of us in heaven as possible. All right? All right. Thank you, everyone. Oh, I forgot. Let me read one more thing. It says, God wants to partner with us to show others and the universe that love wins. Ah, that, that summed it up a little bit better. <laughs> All right. Our closing hymn is found in 608, Faith is the Victory. Wendy, you good?
Please be with us. Give us fear and trembling that we may receive your word and your message, that we may humble ourselves in your sight, that we may learn from those that teach God's love to us. Dear Lord, please keep our hearts and our minds open that we may see your love in every page that we turn. And dear Lord, help us to see your love in every encounter that we have out into the world. Dear Lord, help us to see your love and to show others your love because without you, we are nothing. Dear Lord, please cooperate, be in cooperation with us that we may do your will and not our own. I pray this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.